Um, my name is Rory. I'm a software engineer on the data repository team. Um, so I'm learning about this stuff right around when you guys are learning about this stuff. Um, so far, it's really cool. Um, all right, so call set evaluation. You've got your VCF. You want to go do the fun stuff. You want to go do some analysis. But before you do, you want to figure out what the quality level you have here is. Um, and more than that, you want to make sure that the call set, um, the VCF, is sort of at the best version of itself. You want to make sure you don't need to do additional filtering um, and there aren't bugs in your pipeline. So from what you've seen today, um, we can automate most of this stuff. And we can automate a good chunk of the evaluate call set um, portion, but it's a little bit more of an art than a science in that um, you can evaluate pieces of it. Sorry, you can automate pieces of it, but you need to do some additional work um, to figure out a truth set that you're going to use. Um, and it's important that you understand the metrics that you're going to use um, to evaluate the call set and figure out if it's ready for the next step. So how good is your call set? Um, you want to figure out where you are on this continuum. If you're in a terrible section, you're not a bad person, right? Um, you might have a bug in your pipeline. Um, there might be some issues. Uh, or you might just need to do some additional filtering. Um, if it's ideal, then raise questions about maybe why you're running the specific um, data. If we already have it, if it's already a truth set. Um, so you'll probably be somewhere in the middle. And in order to figure out where you are on that spectrum, um, there are a bunch of different metrics that I'm going to talk about um, that will help you figure out where in that spectrum you are. Um, and in order to run these metrics, to be able to understand them, you're going to want to create a truth set um, that you trust that you can compare all of your data to. Um, so when you're creating your truth set, there are a bunch of things you want to keep in mind. Um, and it's important to realize that you're not going to be able to find the perfect truth set, right? Again, like it can't be so similar to your data because then why are you doing it? Why are you even looking into the data if it already exists in a truth set? Um, but you do need it to be similar in a bunch of different ways. And if you can't find um, an exact truth set that fits these different ways, um, you can subset this. So ways in which you need it to be similar, um, population. The chart here is a great example, right? Um, if your data is looking at a bunch of fins specifically, um, you don't want to be looking at other populations um, to compare the singletons for genome. You're going to think your data is skewed. Um, for the sequencing and experimental design, you want to make sure you're looking at um, the same type of data. So whole genomes, uh, you don't want to compare whole genomes with whole exomes. Um, you don't want to compare, uh, if you have family, a family-based um, design, you don't want to compare that with non-family-based. Um, and then cohort size is also important. If you only have like 150 samples that you're looking at, you don't want to compare that with um, like the EXACT project, um, which is going to have uh, 150,000. So a lot more samples. Um, your stats just are going to change. So these are a bunch of different um, resources. Um, dbSNP is uh, a lot of noise. Um, it's sort of um, where you can go if you can't find a truth set somewhere else. Um, XAC, and, XAC and NOMAD um, are so uh, extensive catalog of uh, exomes for XAC. And then for NOMAD, it's um, additional genome information. Um, for uh, the bottom three, those are the ones that we tend to use. They're really great public resources. Um, And this slide is a great example of why the population actually really matters. So um, when you're creating your truth set, it's important that your truth set has a similar population to the samples that you're looking at. Um, here we have a bunch of different uh, projects in the um, studies in the vertical uh, sort of blocks here. Um, it's the SNP count, which is one of the metrics that you're going to use to decide whether your data is any good. Um, and each of the dots is a different sample, and they're color coded um, by the continent, by the um, historical ancestry of where that sample came from. Um, and you can see that depending on the population, it actually changes 
um, how different the samples are from uh, our reference. So you can see that um, for a bunch of the samples that were taken from Africa specifically, which is the red, it's considerably higher. Um, whereas European is here in the blue. Um, and so uh, one answer for that is that the reference is based around um, mainly European samples. So for right now, you're going to have a lot of changes there. Um, another example or another reason um, is that you have a bit of a founder's effect. Um, so for sort of a, um, an extreme case of this, if you have an island somewhere, um, uh, speaking of Iceland, um, where maybe you have a small number of um, people who uh, went there, were colonized, uh, were banished uh, there, um, just ended up there, they end up being the ancestors for a lot of the samples that we ultimately get. Um, and so that can actually change how the SNP number. Um, so the population is really important. Um, all right, so now you kind of know how to make your truth set. Let's talk about uh, the metrics that we're going to use. So you want to know the number of indels and SNPs, um, the indel ratio, so insertions over deletions, um, TITV ratio, transitions over transversion, transversion mutations, um, and then uh, the genotype concordance. And so I'm going to dig into all of those. So um, the number of indels and SNPs, this is a great sort of high level uh, like sanity check. Um, you, depending on, well, for, these are the numbers that you can expect. Um, so a really good way to sort of start out your metrics. Um, for the indel ratio, for common variants, you expect your uh, insertions to be about the same as your deletions. Um, for rare variants, that is less so. Um, for you expect to have uh, more deletions, um, just because they like, haven't been sort of um, over time come out of the, the genome. Um, this one I found really kind of interesting. Um, so the TITV ratio is based on the chemistry. Um, so depending on um, which base it is, you're more likely to transition to a different base. So um, because of the chemistry, A is more likely to transition to G and G to A. Um, similarly, similarly, C to T and T to C. Um, and just from like a mathematical, right, software engineer over here, um, mathematical standpoint, um, it seems like it would, if, it would be just as likely to transition one way or another. Um, so it should be one to two, right? Uh, A to G should be half as likely as A to T or A to C because it's literally two to one. Um, but that's just an indication of noise. So if it's random, that is true. But because of the chemistry, um, we know that it's actually four to six times as likely um, for with genomes and six with exomes. Again, it's with the exomes, it's the chemistry um, difference. Um, so they're much more likely. And as you get closer to uh, one half, you can see that it's, it's more of a random thing. Yeah. Um, are these uh, assessed like exome and genome like, or is it a subset of the genome that's sort of assessed for these metrics? Hmm. I assume if in this case it's the whole thing, but I'm probably, I should be making assumptions about specific, yeah. No worries. Um, so, so the question, if I understand correctly, is, is this, are, are these uh, metrics evaluated across the whole genome? Um, so it, it depends what experimental design you're, you're using, and certainly you should, you should do the metric evaluation based on what was the sequencing uh, design. So if you're working with whole exome, you should limit the evaluation to the exome territory that was sequenced. Um, for whole genome, you can put in the, the, the whole genome. Um, and this is because th there are such strong differences. You want to make sure that you're measuring the right thing. So one connected question is, let's say we're looking at panel sequencing. Mm -hmm. um, and panel, panel during live sequencing, for example, how would this change? Uh, how would this change for panels? I think that would be easy. Yeah. We would expect it to be similar, right? Yeah, I... I Speaking of... That the shorter is the sequence, so if you take a panel, the TITV ratio usually grows. I don't have the background kind of explanation to that, but empirically that's what I've seen. So you would expect it to be like greater than three. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and I would say, I mean, part of part of the difference is because you have these um, like CPG islands uh, that that affect these ratios, and those are concentrated in coding regions, if I recall correctly. And so you see that more; they're more concentrated in exome compared to the whole genome. And then when you look at panels, you're narrowing further to things that are definitely. Uh, almost definitely in, in coding regions, uh, whereas exome you will still have a lot of stuff on the sides. So I think it's it's the narrowing of this territory on, on that type of region. Does that make sense or? Yeah, it makes perfect sense, but I was just wondering if there were benchmarks, similar benchmarks for these metrics that, again, panel sequencing is gonna be heterogeneous depending on your bait set, et cetera, but are there metrics that depend on like the length of the bait set that would be equivalent to what you're putting out for a whole exome whole genome? Not that I'm aware of, um, but there might be some uh, out there. I, I would say generally, I mean, this is something that you can, you should be able to evaluate by looking at the, ultimately the reference and evaluating what it looks like um, on, on the true <laughs> uh, reference, uh, restrict to that territory and get the value that you're supposed to be aiming for. And, and your data set should get as close to that as possible. Thank you. All right, you guys, you're so close to coffee. Um, all right, so for the final metric, um, you're looking at concordance. So for genotype concordance, um, you want to look for specifically um, whether the calls that you are seeing are um, homozygous or heterozygous. Um, and I think here we tend to use um, the chip for this, um, and that allows us to see uh, whether our calls were correct or not. Um, Additionally, we want to make sure that as we're evaluating concordance, we're using orthogonal methods. Um, so for your truth set, it would be great um, if it's done in a different way, right? So you don't want to use the exact same machine um, or same type of machine, because um, then you're just repeating biases. Um, for the gene chips, um, I think you're almost like a unit test or like a small spot check. You're looking for specific variants. Um, and like was mentioned on the previous slide, um, whether you've gotten the genotype correct or not. Um, so to dig into both variant concordance and genotype concordance, um, for variant concordance, what you're looking for is specifically um, the sensitivity. So how many true positives you found um, out of the entire gold standard set? Um, and then for Additionally, like the false um, ones that you found, so false, false positives out of everything that you found. Um, and then additionally, of the uh, true positives, um, so things that you found that were also in the gold standard, making sure that the genotype is the same. Um, so here, um, I, only four of them got the correct genotype. Um, all right, so once you have your truth set, once you understand your metrics, um, you can use GATK4, um, which will actually do most of this for you. Um, well, not finding your truth set. Um, but we'll give you the metrics. Uh, I believe it will give you about three and a half. So it'll do the um, uh, indel ratio. It'll do in, um, Stimson indel count, indel ratio, um, TITV, and then it'll do the variant concordance, um, but it won't do the genotype concordance. So you're going to do that separately um, using Picard. So now that you have your metrics and your VCF and you're like ready to go and start with analysis, um, there's one more step, and uh, it's that you're going to go into a room with a bunch of your peers um, and discuss whether you're ready or not to actually pass this on. Um, and uh, at that point, maybe you need to go back, do additional filtering. Maybe you found a bug, um, you need to adjust your pipeline. Um, but that's it. Once you're finally ready, your peers agree, you're ready to go analyze and stuff.